Here's the old state house in Hartford, Connecticut. Across Main Street is a tobacco shop called Smokey's and a large parking lot. This is the spot where Hartford's first skyscraper once stood. It was built for the Hartford National Bank in 1912 and was 11 stories tall. It was designed by architect Don Barber, who also designed Traveler's Tower just a few years later. As the years went by, the building became known as the Hartford Etna Building, and much, much taller buildings would rise up in downtown Hartford around it. By the late 1980s, after Society for Savings purchased the old bank building, plans were afoot to demolish it and replace it with a massive new office tower. Preservationists fervently tried to save the historic building, while others declared it to be of no architectural value. It was eventually demolished on April 1st, 1990. In this video, I'm going to talk about the history of the site from the earliest colonial days through the three major commercial buildings that existed here from 1821 through 1990. <music> So let's take a look at some historical maps. These are the same ones I used in my last video about the history of the corner of Main and Pearl Streets. If you haven't seen that video, I'll put the link for it in the description below. The first map here was created in the 19th century to show the roads and property owners in Hartford in 1640. The arrow is pointing to Meeting House Yard which is where the old state house is today. Zooming in just west of Meeting House Yard is the road labeled Palisado to Sentinel Hill. That's today's Main Street. West of that, what's called the road from the Meeting House is today's Pearl Street. Further north is where Asylum Street is today, but it's not shown on this map because Asylum Street wasn't laid out until 1801. Just north of where Asylum Street is today is the home lot of the original settler John Haynes, which was early on sold to John Pratt. The next map shows the buildings along Main Street at the time of the Revolutionary War. At the bottom of the map is South Green. We're going to focus on the area to the north of that. Zooming in, I've put a square around the old Haynes Pratt lot that I showed on the last map. At the time of the Revolution, this property was divided between Joseph Pratt, a descendant of John Pratt, on the north, and on the south, Samuel Wadsworth, a farmer and sea captain who died in 1799. According to William DeLoss Love in his 1914 book, The Colonial History of Hartford, Captain Wadsworth's house, quote, stood on an embankment said to have been eight feet high near the north corner of Asylum Street. He had a barn and cow yard on the west, unquote. Our last map depicts downtown Hartford in 1824. Let's zoom in yet again. I've circled the old Wadsworth property. By the time of this map in 1824, the property had been bought by Henry L. Ellsworth. Henry had a notable father, Oliver Ellsworth, who was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention and later served as the third Chief Justice of the United States. Henry Ellsworth developed a lot of property in Hartford in the 1820s, including buildings on Central Row next to the old State House. He and his twin brother bought the Wadsworth property and in 1821 erected a building right at the corner of Main and Pearl that would stand there until 1897. And here's a photograph from 1895 that shows the west side of Main Street north of Asylum Street. Here's the building erected by Ellsworth in 1821. It became known as the Catlin Building after a later owner named Julius Catlin. In the mid-19th century, Catlin had one of the largest dry goods stores in the city on the building's first floor. He was a prominent citizen of Hartford who served as Lieutenant Governor of Connecticut from 1858 to 1861. The Catlin Building is typical of commercial structures built in Hartford in the 1820s. The building just to the north, called the Hills Block, was built in 1861. By that time, buildings in Hartford were getting a little grander and the Italianate style was popular. The Hills Block was designed by the architect Octavius Jordan, who also designed Samuel Colt's mansion, Armsmere on Wethersfield Avenue. Let's zoom in on the Catlin Building. There were many different businesses that occupied spaces in the building over the years. Two signs on the building in this 1895 photo have the name David Meyer. 
He'd come to America from Mainz, Germany in 1847 when he was 17 years old. He eventually built what was the largest diamond business in Connecticut at the time. Starting around 1870, he leased space in the corner storefront of the Catlin Building. The address was 319 Main Street. His store was known for its fabulous annual display of diamonds every December. According to his obituary in the Jewelers Circular in 1898, there was no diamond merchant in the state better known than he. For many years, he was a familiar figure on the streets of Hartford. His figure was of striking appearance. Tall, erect, and broad-shouldered, he was a well-dressed but not a dressed-up man. Meyer had 15 children from two marriages. The youngest two were twins, Morris and Frederick. When David Meyer retired in 1895, his sons formed a successor firm with James J. Grace called Meyer, Grace, and Meyer. Well, let's talk about some of the businesses that were in this building. Here's a photograph of the building in 1897, just months before it was torn down. From 1870 until 1895, just two years before the photo, the back part of the building, 14, 16, and 18 Asylum Street, had been home to Freeman's Clothing Store. In 1895, the store moved down to 34 to 38 Asylum Street, just a few doors down, and it remained there until it moved again in the 30s. By the time this photo was taken, early in 1897, five businesses were renting space in the building, and they all had to find new quarters because the trustees of the Catlin estate were going to tear it down and erect a new multi-story building that would be exclusively devoted to George O. Sawyer's dry goods store. So the Crawford Shoe Store, which was in the old Freeman store space, was one of the five businesses that had to vacate the premises. The others were, uh, first, on the asylum side, Solomon and DeLue Cigars and Tobacco. On the Main Street side, there was Charles A. Rapelli Druggist, Hansel Sloan and Company Jewelers, and, of course, the jewelry store that we already talked about, Meyer, Grace, and Meyer. Let's zoom in on that store. On January 13, 1897, the Hartford Current reported, quote, Meyer, Grace, and Meyer, the jewelers at the corner of Main and Asylum Streets, are experiencing no little trouble in locating a suitable store for their large diamond and jewelry business. And this morning began a forced sale of their entire stock, including fine diamonds, watches, jewelry, clocks, sterling silver novelties, manicure goods, etc., marked down to cost, and in many instances to less than cost, unquote. Here's an ad for the sale that appeared a month later. And two weeks after that, this ad appeared. Now something interesting happened. When the deadline to vacate arrived on April 1st, 1897, the very day that demolition was slated to begin, Meyer, Grace, and Meyer hadn't budged. As the current reported that day, with the headline, They Will Not Move, quote, The store occupied by Meyer, Grace, and Meyer in the old Catlin building, which is to be replaced with a new building, has been let for many years to David Meyer, who has sublet it to the new firm. When notices were sent out to the tenants of the building to vacate April 1st, none was received by David Meyer, although Meyer Grayson Meyer received such a notice. As the subleasees have received no notice to vacate from Mr. Meyer, who hires the store from the owners, they don't propose to move out today, and matters at this time are somewhat complicated. Unquote. The current continued the story the following day. Quote, the firm of Meyer, Grace, and Meyer was doing business yesterday afternoon under difficulties. The building, which is being torn down, had part of the roof gone, the upper windows all out, and a general air of desertion about it. This of itself would not have been an insuperable bar to the transaction of a retail jewelry business, although it might have added discomfort to a normal situation. A fence eight feet high, chicken tight, is quite another matter when it becomes a dividing line between merchant and customer. This is just the sort of offense the Catlin estate put up on the sidewalk, about midway between the curb and the building on both the main and Asylum Street fronts of the property. The public was using the portion of the walk outside the fence, Meyer, Grace, and Meyer, the sole occupants of the building, had the inside track all to themselves. A reporter of the current crawled under one of the openings at the end of the new fence, which had not been closed yesterday afternoon, 
and stumbled his way over the debris into the store. The members of the firm were apparently ready to do business. The situation was inquired into. Well, the situation shows for itself. You can see it. We are here, said one of the firm, because we claim not to have been legally notified to vacate the premises. Has any further notice than that served upon you been served, or has any notice been served upon Mr. David Meyer, the last named gentleman subletting the store to the present firm? Not at all. Even if the notice we have received was a legal one, the law allows us six days beyond the time limit before we are obliged to get out. We shall see what can be done. Unquote. On April 2nd, a judge issued an injunction on behalf of David Meyer to halt the demolition, and a hearing was quickly convened. At the hearing, the Catlin trustees were represented by the lawyer Charles E. Perkins. By the way, he was a nephew of Harry Beecher Stowe, and he was also Mark Twain's lawyer. At the hearing, David Meyer faced intense questioning by lawyer Perkins, which, according to the current, quote, resulted in the impression that Mr. Meyer could not have been ignorant of the fact that the building was to be torn down yesterday, unquote. One of the trustees then testified that he'd assumed Meyer, Grace, and Meyer were directly his tenants without any subletting by David Meyer and that their lease had ended on March 31st. The judge eventually worked out a compromise where the trustees agreed to temporarily remove part of the fence for a reasonable amount of time for the Meyers to move out their goods. David Meyer tried to get two weeks, but the trustees laughed at this and thought that a day or two at most would be sufficient and the judge agreed to lift the injunction in about two days. So the Myers moved out, and they were able to relocate their store to 26 Asylum Street, but sadly, they went out of business just four months later. So what was the new building that replaced the Catlin building? Well, it was a lot taller, six stories in fact. Here's a picture. You'll notice that at the request of the street board, its corner facing the intersection was a curve instead of an acute angle. This was done to provide more sidewalk space. That was important because this was a very busy corner where people waited to get on the streetcars that all stopped here. Crowding was a problem. As The Current reported on April 9, 1897, quote, we are all creatures of habit, and the Asylum Street habit has become chronic here in Hartford, unquote. The congestion would eventually be eased 15 years later with the construction of the Isle of Safety across the street. Around this time, the neighboring Hills block was also enlarged with the addition of two more stories. So the new building here was entirely occupied by the Sawyer Dry Goods Company, which opened in 1897. This was really a grand department store, and it had the innovation of each department having its own cashier to avoid delays in making change. There were two hydraulic graves elevators and a restaurant with a view on the top floor. The store opened the same year as the Wise Smith department store, just a few blocks to the north. But while Wise Smith would prosper for the next half century, Sawyer's store quickly failed, and its stock was sold to Wise Smith in February of 1900. Later that year, the first floor was remodeled by architect William C. Brocklesby into space for four stores, and the upper floors were rented for offices. In 1907, the building was purchased by the Hartford National Bank. This was a Hartford institution that went all the way back to 1792. The bank had been in a building on State Street since 1811, but now it wanted to demolish the Catlin building, which was only a decade old at that point, and build a grander one that they could move into. The Catlin building was eventually demolished in 1911 and replaced by the 11-story building, which is considered to be Hartford's first skyscraper. When that was eventually demolished in 1990, there were some who questioned its architectural value. But when the building opened in 1912, a current reporter admired it as, quote, the most striking building upon the landscape of the 20th century Hartford, unquote. He even thought that it had a similar focal vantage point for Hartford that the Flatiron Building did in New York. Hmm... To briefly go over the building's later history, the Hartford Bank merged with the Aetna National Bank in 1915 to form the Hartford Aetna National Bank. In 1927, Hartford Aetna merged with the United States Security Trust Company to form the Hartford National Bank and Trust Company, which moved to the corner of Main and Pearl Streets to a building that I talk about in another video that I've linked below. From 1927, the old building continued to be owned by 
what was called the Hartford Aetna Realty Corporation, which was set up as a separate entity in 1927. In 1929, Hartford Aetna leased the building to Schultz United Stores Incorporated, which undertook a remodeling, with plate glass storefronts replacing the stone and brick on the first floor. Liggett's Drug Store rented the corner store for $40,000, and the North Store went for $45,000. These were large amounts at the time. They were expensive because, according to The Current on September 9, 1928, local real estate men believed this to be one of the most valuable corners in New England outside Boston. Now, Schultz United went ahead and demolished the neighboring Hills Block, and they built a new building, a new store there, which opened in 1929 and was considered to be a junior department store. But Schultz United went bankrupt in 1931, and that's the store that for many years after became a J.J. Newberry store. In 1943, Hartford Aetna Realty Corporation voted to end its existence, and the building had a number of other owners over the years. From 1943 to 1956, it was actually owned by the New York millionaire Vincent Astor. And in 1970, it was bought by Society for Savings. And as we know, they demolished it on April 1st, 1990. So what's in the future for this important corner of Hartford? Well, only time will tell. So thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. And if you enjoyed it, please hit the like button. You can also subscribe to the channel, leave comments below. And uh, as you can see here, I have books and websites that you can also check out. See you next time.